Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew. I'm reporting from a virtual background from another location in Florida. And I'm going to try to make all these backgrounds pictures from Florida, which is going to be easy for me because I've traveled throughout Florida often in my life. And this is called Guinea Springs in the background. Super peaceful, beautiful place. Um, I'm going to jump right into the material, but I always start with a little bit about my business and a motivational quote, and then we'll begin. So about my business, I just have another review from a student, Brighton. Ibis's approach to writing essays was meaningful. I ditched my old ways and opened up to theirs. My new ways, putting pen to paper, focusing on rule statements, and meditating on the law throughout the day. I wish Ibis's approach was taken up in my first and second attempts at Flores Bar, but so be it, I passed Flores Bar in my third attempt. Thank you, Ibis, I feel blessed. Cool thing about Brighton is I invited him and um, you know, students always ask me, hey, let's go out and get a drink. And I have a rule, not until you pass the test. Um, Brighton came to our holiday party at the uh, Scarpetta in the Fountain Blue this past holiday season. And he was the first one there and we had a really good time. We ended up uh, in Live, the club after. So super fun time. So if you want to be like Brighton, you know, just stick with the program and have faith that we're providing you with the right approach and the right materials and you'll be successful. Now for the quote today, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about these quotes and, and I don't, I, I'm nervous because I don't want to promote a, a person who turns out to be a bad person, you know? Like I'm sure a lot of people quoted Bill Cosby before some of the accusations came out. And I don't, not to say I have any feelings towards him any way. Um, and a lot of people might have political views. And so I don't, I don't want to offend. So. I do spend a lot of time on these motivational quotes. And today is actually a proverb that I found that I think is super cool. Sunshine all the time makes a desert. Arabic, Arabic proverb. This is hard, hard test, right? But life, if we wanted an easy life, we would be living in a desert if it was easy all the time. We asked for this. We went to law school. Um, we could blame maybe our law school for not preparing us well enough, but I'm here to be a helpful contributor to passing this exam and passing it um, with sunshine and flying colors, but not in a desert, in more of a beautiful environment like we have here in Florida. And Florida is the epicenter of a lot of constitutional debate. So, you know, it might be interesting if you're uh, listening to the news or invested in the Supreme Court decisions and politics and things like that, Florida is a, a cool place to be. And you can make a difference. Um, and, and passing this test will be a, a good way to, to do that. So um, let's begin. And I'm, I'm going to begin actually the same way I did contracts by just explaining my perspective on how I would approach a constitutional law um, essay. Now, you're most likely going to get an ordinance or an act or some ruling. And first take note of what is it? Is it a federal legislator? Is it a, in Congress? Is it a state act that's going to be subject to these Florida specific rules? Or is it some sort of um, local ordinance um, or municipal ordinance that might be subject to home rule powers or you know, other specific rules? Or is it something like a, a policy by a school board or a public function that wouldn't be subject to these Florida specific rules, but would still be subject to the Florida and federal constitution? So first look at what type of um, act or legislation or ordinance are we looking at and what is applicable on its face, um, period. What's applicable on its face? What, what do we need to determine about the piece of legislation or the presented um, policy in front of us? Now, always we have to consider federal rights, right? We have federal constitutional rights. Consider the First Amendment, freedom of speech, and consider that as content-based, strict scrutiny, Make sure you understand the strict, intermediate, and rational basis. We'll go through that. Understand um, what is not protected by the Constitution when it comes to speech. Likely to um, incite imminent lawless activity, or if it's uh, if it's um, obscenity, 
or defamation or um, misleading or fraudulent commercial speech. These will not be protected by the First Amendment, but still see in any way is this act or ordinance or policy impacting our rights under the First Amendment freedom of speech or freedom of religion and freedom of religion in two ways, the um, right to exercise and establishment and the lemon test and that, and that prong. And even though it's been alleviated a little bit by the Supreme Court in, in that decision in Maine, we still wanna talk about the lemon test and how it would be considered if we have a, a, an imposition on our liberties of freedom of speech or freedom of religion, specifically freedom of religion for the lemon test. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and then fundamental rights we're looking at, does it impact you know, the acronym CAMPER, contraception, abortion, marital rights, um, procreation, education, family relations, um, right to travel, right to vote? Is it something that's fundamental and subject to strict scrutiny? Um, we think about the suspect classes, who's being targeted by this policy or this enactment. Is it one of the suspect classes is it race, alienage, national origin? Um, we're even gonna consider in Florida under strict scrutiny, disability. Is it gonna be intermediate scrutiny for gender um, or illegitimacy? Or is it gonna be rational basis, everything else, wealth, age, anything of that nature? So consider you know, first amendment and fundamental considerations. Then we're gonna kind of skip second, but if you see something about guns mentioned second amendment, especially in Florida, we're pretty protective of that, especially around Guinea Springs. Um, Third Amendment, just forget about it. Fourth, fifth, sixth, we will talk about in uh, my criminal law lecture. Um, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then uh, seventh, right to trial by jury. Eighth, talking about cruel and unusual punishment. Maybe you could see that. Ninth, we could generally skip. Um, tenth and eleventh, we're going to be talking about uh, um, state sovereignty and sovereign immunity. So um, the 10th Amendment is going to be state sovereignty, where, um, where the states have the right to make laws that are not preempted by the federal government. So it's going to talk about that preemption piece. And then the 11th is going to be sovereign immunity. And we can think about that actually on a test. Is, is this talking about suing the state or maybe we're just suing a state actor in their individual capacity? Um, and, and who would have jurisdiction if it's, you know, the federal court will have exclusive jurisdiction over controversies between the state. So think about amendment and constitutional considerations. Um, 13th Amendment, if this essay is somehow impacting you know, private activity based on race. If it's a restaurant discriminating based on race, that would impact 13th Amendment. I don't really see that. 14th Amendment, definitely. We're highly likely to see first and 14th Amendment on an essay. First being some, you know, uh, some constitutional uh, encroachment on our liberties of freedom of speech or freedom of religion or our fundamental rights. And then we're gonna talk about what class is subject to it. And then 14th amendment, equal protection, always talking about the discriminating against a certain class of people. And this is gonna be the same thing where we talk about the, um, the strict scrutiny, intermediate rational basis and, and things like that as it applies to equal protection. Because the, remember the 14th amendment is going to consider uh, the um, due process to the states. And so we will think about due process. We'll think about um, procedural notice and hearing, and we'll think about substantive due process. Substantive due process, similar to equal protection, but it's when everyone is being, their substantive rights are being, um, are being violated. Whereas equal protection is just gonna mean a specific class of people but we're always gonna think of equal protection, due process, um, also access to courts is a big one. Are they, are they um, restricting your access to courts, which is a fundamental right? Only way possible, and remember this is a little gem for you all, is through the Kluger Doctrine. The Kluger Doctrine in Florida is a doctrine that allows 
um, restriction of access to courts if there's a public necessity. So um, yeah, we think about all these fundamental rights, equal protection, due process, um, First Amendment, these are all federal lens of, of looking at things. And then once we're already on that 14th Amendment, well, we should think about privileges um, or immunities from the Article 4. And privileges or immunities from Article 4 is going to be about out-of-staters. Maybe this, this um, law or whatever this ordinance we're looking at is violating the rights of out-of-staters under privileges and immunities or privileges or immunities um, clause. And it's usually going to be Article 4, not 14th Amendment. Um, so equal protection, privilege or immunities, and then maybe commerce clause is a big one. Talk quickly about the commerce clause. Is this thing impacting the commerce clause? Is that a way that the federal legislation is, is passing because um, it is, uh, you know, they can regulate the instrumentalities, um, the economic activities that in aggregate have a substantial impact on government activities and the channels of commerce. So channels, the instrumentalities and the economic activities, maybe it's commerce clause. Well, if it's commerce clause, we're also gonna think about dormant commerce clause. Okay, the dormant commerce clause saying that like, they can't unduly burden um, interstate commerce. So these are all federal lens ways of looking at things. Maybe the um, speech and debate clause, if, if that would come up in the legislator, that legislators are um, protected from their acts while in their legislative capacity, but that'll have to be federal. Uh, try and think of any other federal lens issues that I, would come up. I mean, we'll see on the outline, but general way speaking, First Amendment, 14th Amendment, equal protection, due process, privileges and immunities, um, commerce clause, dormant commerce clause. Those are gonna be some of the big issues. Another one that flies over people's heads, encroachment. Definitely look out for encroachment. Is this act or ordinance giving um, power to uh, a body, a legislator, the legislator or the judiciary that is not supposed to have? Are they letting um, the sheriff officer make uh, judicial decisions? So that's something we should also always be keen on is encroachment. It's making me think of some other issues right here. Impairment of contracts. Is this impairing uh, a, a private or public contract? Ex post facto, is this punishing behavior retroactively? Or um, bill of attainder, is this putting people in jail without giving them a proper trial? So these are a lot of things we can think about just from a federal perspective already. Is this violating any of the person's rights? Okay, then I'm gonna also look at it from a Florida lens, and there's a lot of things to look at. Number one is, is this a bill? Is this something that's being brought into a law in the state of Florida? And then what type of law is it? Is it a specific law? Is it a general law? Is it a general law of local application? Specific laws need that vote. That's gonna be an important piece for a specific law. We're gonna think about, oh, it's Florida. Who, what county is it? Is it a chartered county or is it an unchartered county? Chartered county, we're going to think of the home rule power. The home rule power is what's going to give um, chartered counties and municipalities the authority to, to introduce legislation. Obviously, it's preempted by the Florida Constitution and by the federal Constitution um, if, it, if it in any way conflicts. So we're going to think about that. Then we're going to think about the actual law itself. Has it complied with the laws necessary to enact in Florida, does it have a clear title? Does it have a single subject? Is it not vague and overbroad? Is it for the welfare, the morals, and the health of, of the people? Um, is it single subject? Um, does it have an enactment clause being enacted in the state of Florida? Go through that entire uh, lens. And we'll look at the difference between an act and a, a law in Florida. There's some subtle differences, but we'll, we'll go through that analysis. Vagueness and overbreath, I cannot stress, comes up on every essay. It's like negligence and torts. You know, you just always want to put it in there that it could be vague or it could be overbroad. So I'm looking at this from a, a definite Florida lens. I have my, my 
peakers on for the sunshine law. There's so many issues that come up with the sunshine law because it's Florida specific. And since this is a Florida specific test, they like to test things specific, sunshine law and homestead exemption. Sunshine law, all the um, governmental proceedings need to be in the sunshine, in the public light so that we have access to the what's said and, and what's going on and the minutes and all those things. And the homestead exemption, which we'll talk about also in real property, but again, in, in con law, which is you have protected half acre inside a municipality, 160 acres outside a municipality that's protected against creditors, except for a few taxes, mortgage, you know, liens on the actual property, um, things like that. So, uh, yeah, very specific Florida ways of looking at this. Is it, um, is it again, the chartered versus uncharted counties, the home rule powers, the um, specific Florida enactment clauses, um, what type of law is it, general law, local law of, of um, general law of local application, which we based on population and doesn't require a vote, and then just a uh, special law, which is to just like a, a special county. So we're looking at all those things from a Florida law perspective. Um, you know, that's a pretty good start, right, to what we could consider. I'm trying to think of some other issues that I've encountered on Florida essays. Um, definitely some, and, and we'll get into it, but that was just kind of off the top of my head, like, and, and that's what we should be able to do is just have an idea of, okay, this is a con law essay, what am I looking out for? All those federal implications from the constitution, all our rights that I know about from constitutional law, and then all the Florida specific things, including homestead exemption and the sunshine law, and then the specificities for enacting a law or an ordinance in Florida. Um, and I, I talked about, oh, and then the right to privacy. Definitely, we have a heightened, heightened right to privacy in Florida and they could be invading on that. Um, yeah, things like that. So I hope you enjoyed that. Now let's get into the material itself and see, you know, if I missed anything. Um, again, this is a federal lens. I'll start with, with the federal lens, what we need to know. The Commerce Clause. Under the Commerce Clause in the US Constitution, Congress has the authority to regulate interstate commerce. This includes the channels of interstate commerce, roads, railways, and waterways, the instrumentalities of interstate commerce, trucks, boats, airplanes, and internet, and economic activities that when aggregated have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. However, this authority is not absolute. States are allowed to regulate commerce if such regulation is not preempted by federal law, and so long as the state regulation does not discriminate against out-of-staters. If the state regulation discriminates on its face against out-of-staters, it violates the Dormant Commerce Clause unless the regulation is necessary for compelling state interest. That's gonna be strict scrutiny. If the regulation does not discriminate against out-of-staters, it is usually upheld so long as it does not unduly burden interstate commerce. Citizens, including individuals and corporations, as well as aliens can sue on a cause of action arising under the Dormant Commerce Clause. Congress has provided two exceptions to the Dormant Commerce Clause as important consent by Congress and when the state acts as a market participant. Look at that, when the state is actually involved. A state acts as a market participant when it assumes um, the role of an entity in the marketplace, such as a corporation, and participates in the market itself. So I always get this mixed up. It's privileges and immunities from Article 4. So privileges and immunities. The privileges and immunities clause guarantees that citizens of each state shall be given the privileges and immunities of citizens of all states. A state law which discriminates against out-of-staters as to fundamental right or civil liberties, including the ability to earn a livelihood, violates privileges and immunities clause unless a substantial justification exists. Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Equal Protection Clause on the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution applies when the government is making a distinction between similarly situated people. If the classification is based on race or national origin, the state must meet strict scrutiny. If the classification is based on gender, then intermediate scrutiny will be used. Any other classification will be only need to meet rational basis. And this is federal. In Florida, we're also going to add disability to strict scrutiny. The Due Process Clause under the 14th Amendment prohibits the government from acting arbitrarily and unreasonably. Contracts Clause. Under the Contracts Clause of the U.S. Constitution, a state may not impair rights under pre-existing contracts. If the interference is with a private contract, intermediate scrutiny applies. 
if the interference is with the government contract, strict scrutiny applies. And then this last one, oh, I knew I was forgetting something. You know, I want to jump into the material and refresh, but standing and rightness and not mootness. Make sure I've seen an essay where it wasn't ripe yet. So we all understand standing. Injury in fact, causation redressability, ripe not moot. A plaintiff in federal court must have standing in order for the court to hear the case. In order to have standing, the plaintiff must show injury in fact, causation, the plaintiff's harms were caused by the defendant's conduct, redressability, a decision in the plaintiff's favor will redress the injury caused by defendant. For example, a favorable decision will remedy the harm. Ripeness, important, the case must be ripe for judgment. For example, a case is not ripe if the law has yet to be enacted and there's insufficient details in the legislative discussion on its enforcement of the law, which is unlikely to be enforced, and not moot. A case is moot if it, the harm has already occurred and not capable of repetition, but evading review. It's not a live case in controversy. Mootness is um, it's too late, and ripeness is it's too early. All right, that was, that was pretty good. Let's see what else we have. Um, establishment clause. In general, there must be a separation of church and state. And just, again, mention the Supreme Court has recently decided in a case in Maine that prayer in by a football coach is uh, allowed, and this may impact the lemon test. Like, speak on that type of terminology. Don't be too uh, political. Just state what the what the law is. Okay, establishment clause. In general, there must be a separation of church and state. In order to bring a claim under the US Constitution, the establishment clause, there must be a government action. Under the establishment clause, the government cannot take action or promulgate a rule that has the effect of establishing or inhibiting religion. In order to determine whether the government action violates the establishment clause, the court will apply the lemon test. The lemon test has three factors. To meet these three factors, the government must show that the action has a secular purpose, that the action's primary effect is not to advance or inhibit religion, and that there's not excessive entanglement between the government action and religion. The establishment clause is part of the First Amendment, and the First Amendment does not generally apply to government speech. However, when the speech at issue involves religious issues, the Supreme Court has held that the government may not engage in conduct that appears to disproportionately favor one religion. For example, the Supreme Court has held that governments may, take, may place a display in a city hall that depicts a menorah and a Christmas tree to well-known religious symbols because there are multiple religions recognized, not just one. Similarly, the government may include a religious text in a display that includes other types of texts as well. Free exercise. Under the First Amendment of the Constitution, every person has the right to the free exercise of his or her religion. Whether a religion is protected under the Constitution is not based on whether a particular religion, religion is well known or well established. Rather, the court will look at whether the individual has a sincerely held religious belief. Put another way, the question is whether the individual's belief and whether that belief has a similar role in the individual's life as a typical religion would. When a government action or regulation is based on or discriminates against religion, it must pass strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny requires that the government action is necessary to achieve a compelling government interest. The free exercise clause protects religious beliefs. An individual does not give up this right merely because he is in jail. The Supreme Court never clearly defined what constitutes a religious belief protected by the free exercise clause, but has made clear that it extends beyond the traditional religions. The general test is whether the belief holds a place in the individual's life parallel to that of traditional religious beliefs. Then again, equal protection. We're always looking for equal protection issues. Citizens are entitled to equal protection in the laws of the United States. This applies to the federal government under the Fifth Amendment and is applicable to states under the 14th. Under the Equal Protection Clause, an action or law that discriminates against a suspect class must pass strict scrutiny. The equal protection analysis depends on whether suspect, quasi-suspect, or fundamental right is implicated. Government conduct that discriminates on the basis of a suspect class, such as race or national origin, as well as government conduct that implicates a fundamental right is subject to strict scrutiny, which means the government must show it's necessary to achieve a compelling purpose. Government conduct that implicates a quasi suspect class such as gender is subject to intermediate scrutiny, meaning the government must show it's substantially related to an important purpose. And in the case of gender must also show an exceedingly persuasive justification. All other government conduct is subject to rational basis review, meaning the challenger must show that it is not rationally related to a legitimate government purpose. 
something I'm going to mention right after this. The due process clause prohibits the government from engaging in arbitrary and capricious conduct under due process. Government action that infringes on a fundamental right must satisfy strict scrutiny, meaning the government must show that is necessary to achieve a compelling purpose. If a fundamental right is not implicated, then the government action is subject only to rational basis, meaning the burden is on the challenger to show that the government action is not rationally related to a legitimate government purpose. As a practical matter, most government action will satisfy rational basis review. So one thing I just want to talk about real quick is at the beginning of this con, con law essay, we should be addressing standing. Do they have standing to sue? And also state action. Mention why is there state action and why the government is implicated. That may be obvious, and it was so obvious to me that I didn't even mention it in my top of the head lecture, but we do need to mention standing and um, obviously all three elements plus rightness and mootness. And uh, we need to mention, um, I just lost my train of thought. We need to mention standing and we need to mention state action that the state has acted, therefore constitutional rights are implicated. Okay, so um, here's a little con law essay, wait, before I get to that. Um, yeah, that's federal con law. And I'm gonna go through um, some federal con law uh, essays in a bit. Oh, here's one, here's one more federal con law essay or outline. So takings, zonings, non-conforming use, variances, amortization, I'll just explain them real quick. Takings is when the government takes from the property and they have to give the owner just compensation. Um, there could be a possessory or regulatory taking. Possessory is when they actually take it. Regulatory is when a law or ordinance basically renders it economically unviable and then you're still, you know, you still get um, just compensation. Zoning power, so you know they do have the power to create zoning laws. Um, and then non-conforming use is being grandfathered into something when you had the ability to do it before the zoning law and now you're applying to continue doing it. Whereas variance means you're applying to do something different, you are never allowed to do it. And amortization is basically, you're allowed to do something different for a little while, you have a non-conforming use for a little while under the agreement that you'll stop doing it over time, you'll, you'll amortize your use. So I'll just read through these bullet points, but that was just a basic understanding of <clears throat> what we're talking about here. So the constitution prohibits wrongful government state action, not private action. State action allows constitutional protections to arise. The power of the government to take private property for public use is known as eminent domain. The taking clause of the Fifth Amendment to the US Constitution provides no property shall be taken for public use without just compensation. The government must provide just compensation for any property taken for public use. Since the Kelo decision, the US Supreme Court has interpreted a public use broadly and deed the public use to even include economic development as well as the classic highway, military base, et cetera. We've seen this with sports stadiums, the Marlin Stadium. The takings clause applies to states and local entities through the 14th Amendment. Regulations are not usually considered takings, but can be in certain circumstances. A regulatory taking is that which deprives the owner of the economic use of his property. A regulatory taking is often found when a regulation deprives the owner completely of any substantial economic use. A regulatory taking analysis can be applied to the states and local entities through the 14th Amendment. To determine if a regulatory taking has occurred, the court will look at the economic impact of the regulatory taking on the property, the owner's reasonable expectation on the return of the investment for the property, and how the burdens of the regulation are distributed across interested community members. We call that the Penn Central Multi-Factor Balancing Test, in which the government determines if an ordinance incurs a taking based upon the government interest to be advanced, the nature of the government regulation, and the degree of interference with the landlord's investment back expectations. That's the key to see if there's been a regulatory taking. Um, we also might see this word, which is very similar to regulatory taking, which would be called inverse condemnation. So zoning powers, the Supreme Court has historically granted deference to municipalities engaged in great zoning powers. Generally, local government has the police power to enact zoning ordinances, so long as they're reasonably related to legitimate government purpose, namely that they relate to protecting the general welfare, so safety, or health of the community. So we can talk about non-conforming use. A non-conforming use occurs when a business or residence is in existence and within the proper use of a state ordinance 
at which point the ordinance subsequently changes and the current use of the property becomes in violation of the current code, your grandfathered in. The non-conforming use must be permitted to continue unless substantial threat to public safety or health is at stake. The non-conforming use may continue as long as the business or use does not cease or a change in ownership of the property occurs. A property that makes substantial investment and obtains the necessary permits for development based on the current zoning ordinance is entitled to complete the project within a reasonable time, even if the zoning ordinance changed in the meantime. Once the government has granted the permission and the parties that has relied on that permission may not be taken away arbitrarily by new ordinances. If such action occurs, the party may rely on the governing zoning and ordinance at the time the project was permitted and began. Landowners may also seek relief through variances and amortization if they do not wish to bring a constitutional claim under Penn Central. A variance can be an area or use. An area variance allows a non-conforming use to vary by the area used. A use variance allows a non-conforming use in an area that is not zoned for that purpose. Use variances are typically harder to secure and the landowner must show an undue burden if the use variance is not granted. An amortization allows a non-conforming use to persist until ownership of the property changes and prohibits the owner from expanding or changing his per permitted non-conforming use. Amortization works to mitigate the impact of a sudden zoning change, which could deprive the landowner of economic use of the property and also reduce the likelihoods of a taking lawsuit. I don't really expect you to get a takings essay, but that was just you know a good thing to, to go over. Um, okay, so we can even see a uh, federal con law essay and, and what was tested on it. Standing, remember, always start with standing. Standing, this was July 2018. These are the, the rules of law. Remember, we write IRACs, issue rule analysis conclusion. And I prefer IRA, oh, issue rule analysis opposing argument conclusion, weak conclusion. Stan, weak conclusion meaning on balance, the court will likely find, however, blah, blah, blah. never like the court will definitely find because you don't want to just be wrong and leave a bad taste in the rear's mouth. Standing. Standing requires injury in fact, particularized specific injury that's suffered by the population at large, but rather unique to the plaintiff. Causation or addressability, um, that a decision in the plaintiff's favor would actually rectify the harm or injury. An organization can sue on behalf of its members if individual members could sue in their own right, bring the claim if the claim is related to the organization's purpose, et cetera. Injury not be economic, injury harm can occur when a fundamental right is suppressed. Florida has waived sovereign immunity for operational decisions. Also waive sovereign immunity in terms of consent <clears throat> and you can sue uh, state agents individually for their um, crimes or torts. Okay, the home rule powers. Well, that's gonna be a Florida specific thing, but uh, let's just see, I wanna, I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so well, actually we'll talk about it right now. Under home room powers, a municipality, county in Florida can enact ordinances relating to the health, safety, welfare, or morals of the people. However, such ordinances must not violate the Florida U.S. Constitution, nor be preempted with the same. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, applicable to the states of the 14th, protects the freedom of speech and association and the free movement of ideas through society. So this is important. I'm, I'm happy I got to this. Public speech. Parks are designated public forums, which are areas which historically have been open for speech-related activities. Sidewalks and streets are also examples of typical public forums. Given the history of speech associated with such places, parks are open to the community, free access, et cetera, the government can only place restrictions on speech if certain tests are met. Speech-related laws slash ordinances can be content-based or conduct-based. If they're content-based, they must pack strict scrutiny. If the government has the burden of proving there's an important or compelling interest um, and the ordinance is narrowly tailored or the least restrictive means of achieving the goal. This is a heavy burden to meet. If, however, the regulation is merely conduct-based, is regulating the time, place, or manner of speech without regard to actual conduct content, a different test is used. For a conduct regulation of speech in a public forum, the law must be content neutral, both viewpoint and subject matter neutral. Narrowly tailored, leave open alternative channels of communication. Note, for non-public and designated public forums, the test is even less strict. The law merely must be viewpoint neutral and be rationally related to a legitimate interest. So this viewpoint neutral test is for non-public and designated forums and viewpoint neutral means this. Let's say abortion is the content, pro-abortion or anti-abortion is the viewpoint. Okay, 
The U.S. Supreme Court has held that a licensing requirement do not necessarily violate the Constitution because licensing itself is a time, place, and manner where licensing is permitted if the individuals in charge are not given specific delineated standards by which to make the decisions regarding when, whether to issue a license, this is problematic. Unprotected speech, not all speech is protected. Speech that is likely to incite imminent loss activity is not protected, however, prior restraints are strongly disfavored. Loud and indecent speech is protected by the First Amendment. The US Supreme Court has expressly held that, for example, the state cannot prohibit an individual from wearing a jacket with the F word in a courtroom because this is simply an expression of ideas and not inciting imminent danger. Vagueness, always looking for vagueness and overbreath. A vague law is one that doesn't provide fair notice. For example, that a person of average intelligence would not be able to clearly understand what's permitted and what's prohibited. Procedural due process, again, procedural due process contemplates fair procedure, life, liberty, or property is to be taken away. There must be a fair process which involves notice and opportunity to be heard before a neutral decision maker, the right to appeal. When fundamental rights are infringed upon, the state action law is subject to strict scrutiny. A Kluger doctrine style defense, access to courts can in fact be restricted so long as there's a compelling public necessity and there's no reasonable alternative. Equal protection. When the state regulates a suspect class, strict scrutiny is applied. The equal protection does not prohibit all discrimination, rather it only prohibits unreasonable discrimination. And wealth is not a suspect class, unlike race, alienage, national origin, et cetera, including physical disability under Florida Constitution. Given that wealth is not a suspect class, rational basis review is applied. Striking of unconstitutional parts or ordinances. If one or more parts of the parks ordinance is found unconstitutional, the courts may be able to strike that portion and save the rest, providing the ordinance has a savings clause. Okay, that's a lot about um, federal con law. Let's see what else we have here from another federal con law essay. Standing, actual injury or threat of an injury, causation, redressability, freedom of speech and association. The US and Florida constitutions both protect the right to freedom of speech and association as protected expression. These rights are deemed to be fundamental to our citizens' pursuit of order liberty. They're among the most fundamental of any rights, strict scrutiny, <clears throat> speech is regulable and there could be um, legal and other consequences for speech. This is not directly prohibited by the constitution. Any infringements on the right are subject to rigorous review, public forum, um, such as a public or sidewalk uh, must be valid. It, it, so it, time, place and manner, content-based or viewpoint-based is triggers a strict scrutiny analysis. To survive strict scrutiny must be compelling, narrowly tailored and less restrictive means. Um, federal tort Claim Act has waived the U.S. sovereign immunity for suit and tort. The act has not waived immunity as to torts such as false imprisonment, defamation. However, it will cover and does not prevent a suit based on an employee's negligent act. Okay, so that's standing to sue. There's a compelling interest and they validly argument it. All right, this was a tough one. I remember this, this, uh, this essay was very tough. So the state of Florida may sue through its attorney general from relief from unconstitutional legislation. To prevail, they must have standing and also assert a cognizable case against the government. The government is not immune from suits by the states in federal court and the proper form for an action between the state of Florida and the United States will be the Supreme Court who has original jurisdiction under the constitution to hear a case between a state and the federal government. Any legislation that a constitution at the federal level and conflicts with the state legislation preempts the state legislation to the extent of any conflict. Oh, this is very important. I, something else I forgot about on my top of the head lecture, the commandeering clause. Always look out for commandeering. Federal acts which require a state to enact legislation may be unconstitutional as commandeering. So remember, they can not compel a state, but they can um, uh, persuade via funding um, restrictions or things like that. This is because of the protections of federalism in the US Constitution, which prohibit the federal government from requiring states to enact legislation. However, the feds may condition certain funding on the passage of constitutional legislation, conditions of funding. The US Constitution requires standing in addition to having a live case in controversy and rightness. Um, without a live case in controversy, an Article Three federal court is without subject matter jurisdiction to entertain the case. The likely outcomes, um, so it was that this case was not right. Oh, another thing that we didn't talk about, executive powers of the president, options with regard to the act. 
To become a law, the President of the United States must sign the legislation or the Congress must repass the legislation of the president's, president's signature. Unlike the state of Florida, the president may simply choose not to act on a bill and do what's known as a pocket veto, where in Florida, there's um, no such thing as a pocket veto by letting the bill go unsigned at the end of the legislative session. Legislation in the United States works similar to state legislation. There must be bicameralism, which means the bill must originate in one house and pass in both houses to be a simple majority. Additionally, there must be presentment where the past bill is presented to the president for signature. A president may choose to sign or veto a bill, and in the event of a veto, the Congress may pass the legislation over the president's veto by a two-thirds majority. Legislation that is not passed by one of these two methods is not current and enforceable legislation. Line item veto is unconstitutional, federal and in Florida. The president, unlike the Florida governor, is without the power to ask the Supreme Court for an advisory opinion on the matter. So the president, no advisory opinion. In Florida, you can ask for advisory opinion. Um, and then this one talks about equal protection, 14th Amendment, prohibition on the states from depriving any citizen of due process of law, procedural and substantive, subsect classes are race, religion, national origin, strict scrutiny, quasi-suspect is gender and legitimacy, important interests substantially related. Um, Brown versus Board of Education held that a right to an equal and valuable education is fundamental right of the U.S. children. And then this commandeering clause, I really want to talk about this because I missed it in my, in my, uh, my uh, top of the head lecture. So the federal constitution contains an explicit prohibition from the federal government ordering a state to pass legislation by command of the federal government. The idea is that this implicates the implicit separation of powers between the federal government and the states known as federalism. When federal legislation requires a state to pass laws, they're unconstitutional. However, the federal government may legislate to clarify that states do have certain authority if it stops short of a command. Additionally, if such an act is an enablement and not a command to legislate, the federal government may validly condition certain discretionary funding given to the states through the taxing and spending powers of the U.S. government in Article I of the Constitution, but they may not act wholly coercively. So the constitutionality depends upon the extent that they see the actions relating to the goal of preventing distraction in education and would likely fail that um, it, it does not require them to act. So remember on essays, we're always gonna talk about weak versus strong arguments, no matter what. The more arguments we can present, the more points we could possibly get. Um, it's another Florida federal, oh, no, we already did this one. Okay, Florida con law. I think that's about it for the federal con law ones. Um, oh no, this was one of the ones on standing. Pursuant to the powers of eminent domain, the state and local governments may take appropriate or physically invade private property for justifiable public purpose with just compensation due and owning to the owner of that property. Eminent domain also covers the taking of personal property. Under Florida constitutional law, there's no requirement for compensation when through the use of eminent domain powers, government destroys an immediate serious threat to public health, welfare, or safety. Under Florida's equal protection laws, which strongly mirror the US Constitution, no citizen may be deprived of the equal protection of the law. If it's a fundamental right, race, religion, national origin, Florida physical disability, strict scrutiny applies. Under due process, no one will be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, which requires notice and hearing, vagueness, overbreath, rational relatedness. Under Florida Constitution, the right to privacy is expressed and fundamental and therefore considered to be stronger than the protection set forth by the US Constitution. And the Fourth Amendment, both under the Florida Constitution and U.S. Constitution, protects against unlawful searches and seizures, and we'll talk about this. Specifically, under the Florida Constitution, people are entitled to be secure in their homes, effects, persons, and papers. So we'll talk about that in my, my crim law um, essay. But remember, when you get an essay, you don't know if it's multiple subjects being tested. So just write what you know about and, and get all the points you can in that time. Okay, so that was pretty thorough on Florida, I mean, I'm sorry, on federal con law. Let's take a look at some of the Florida con law rules and things we need to know. Um, okay, act or ordinance. Attack the act or ordinance through multiple lenses of the constitution, through the lens of Florida, the sunshine law, access to public records and meetings. We gotta talk about the sunshine law. Every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record made or received in connection with official business of any public body officer employee. Memorize this definition, I'll read it twice. Every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record made or received in connection with official business of any public body, officer, employee. 
all means of the state must be um, of the local government body at which public business is transacted or discussed must be open to the public and they must be given notice. This affects all levels of state and local government and persons acting on behalf of the government. This includes informal conversations among the officials, amongst officials. There are some exceptions to protect police officers, minors, and tipsters. Exception, informal meetings and conversations among state legislators do not require notice and are not open to the public unless they are prearranged and involve three or more legislators or at least one legislator and the governor. Okay, here's another thing. So we're talking about Florida specific things. The governor has authority under the Florida constitution to call a special legislative session. Okay, so another thing we're thinking about from a Florida lens, I kind of forgot about that in my top of the head. There's a lot to think about here, but if we see it, we'll recognize it. They can call a special legislative session. Special legislative sessions must be limited in scope to what it was called for. And in the absence of the requisite vote of the members of the House and Senate, a two thirds vote, no new matters may be addressed during a special session other than those for which the special session was caused. So again, the enactment of the law, stats, state statutes are enacted by state legislator in Tallahassee and ratified by the governor. Ordinances are local laws enacted by municipalities, also known as cities and counties. Um, substantive requirements for statutes and ordinances are void. If the wording is unclear, the statute may be void for vagueness. Must be clearly worded so the average person of common intelligence will understand them. Overbroad. Laws must not be overbroad. Overbreath means that it punishes more than necessary or intended. It cannot prohibit constitutionally protected activities along with unprotected. It protects, punishes legal speech. So I always say that, like what if they had a law that said a teacher can't use four letter words? Well, that would be overbroad because the word door is four letters. Law must bear a reasonable relationship with health, safety, morals, and welfare of the people. Now these are the procedural requirements for statutes, not ordinances. There's a difference between statutes and ordinances. Statutes must be enacting clause, be enacted by the state of Florida, must be read three times into legislative rec rec record, must pass both houses in identical form by cameralism. The sta statute subject must be stated in the title. The title must be short and sufficiently describe the subject matter of the law. The statute must cover a single subject. The governor must sign all bills into law. If the legislator is in session, the governor has seven days to sign or veto. If he doesn't sign or veto, it becomes law. If the legislator is not in session, the governor must sign or veto within 15 days after presentment or the bill automatically becomes law. So general laws enacted by the state legislator apply uniformly statewide to all persons in all circumstances. Special laws are enacted by state legislator, but only apply to specific regions of the state, like a particular city or county. They have special rules before they can be enacted. There must be notice of intention to enact the law published in a newspaper of general circulation in all affected counties or the law must be approved by a referendum of the majority of electors. General laws of special application, these are population-based and ways to get around the referendum, basically. Legislators can try to avoid the procedural requirements for special laws by enacting general laws that target a region by some alternative means. To be valid, there must be a nexus or reason for the criteria other than targeting a particular region. The most common means is by population. Now, the home rule powers, I talked about this, applies to municipalities. Municipalities may enact ordinances that do not conflict with the Florida federal constitution, the ability to establish its form of government through its charter, and then to enact ordinance codes, plans, and resolutions without prior state approval is a tremendous authority. The most pre precious powers a city in the Florida has are its home rule powers. It states, municipalities have the governmental, corporate, and proprietary powers to enable them to conduct municipal government, perform municipal functions, and render municipal services and may exercise power for municipal purposes except as otherwise provided by law. These powers do not extend to fiscal home rule. The state reserves all taxing authority into itself. Chartered versus unchartered counties. A county is a political subdivision of the state. Counties can be chartered or non-chartered. Chartering a county broadens the scope of the local government power. Date is chartered. Known charter is not self-governed, cannot enact ordinances. Chartered counties may have all powers not inconsistent with general law or with special laws approved by vote of the electors and may enact any ordinances not consistent with general law, so through the home rule powers. Non-chartered counties may enact ordinances provided by special or general law. The authority is general and special law. So that's um, the Florida Constitution. Here, this is just a little outline about um, some things from federal that, that we've seen. Suspect class, race, 
alienage, national origin, travel, voting, other rights recognized as fundamental. Super solid. Um, just to leave no stone unturned, see if we mixed anything, of course, access to courts. Everyone has the right to access to courts regardless of injury, without sale or denial. Look for a state passing a law that abolishes a cause of action or restricts a person's access to courts without providing a reasonable alternative. The burn is on the state to show an overpowering necessity for the abolition of such a right, and there's no alternative method of meeting such public necessity, otherwise unconstitutional, that Kluger doctrine. Right to a jury trial, this right exists for issues that were triable before jury at common law at the time of the adoption of the state's first constitution, you know, so usually legal damages. Amendments to the Florida Constitution must be approved by a vote of 60% of the people voting in the matter. We talk again about the right to privacy. Every person has the right to be left alone and free from governmental intrusion in their private life. The right to privacy is expressly stated in the Florida Constitution and the standard of review in Florida Constitution, US Constitution is identical. And here's a new one, a right to work. Florida Constitution prohibits union shops and states that no person may be denied a job based on their membership, non-membership in a labor union. Ties in the fundamental right to come together and bargain collectively. It violated must review strict scrutiny. Look for a fact pattern where a union negotiates a contract requiring employees to become union members or pay dues before, upon, or after hiring. Very important Sunshine Law. Sunshine Law states that everyone has right access to public records, including government records and non-government parties acting under the control of government. All governmental meetings must be open to the public and must provide notice of such meetings to the public. Exception informal meetings, such as meetings that are not prearranged and involve less than three people, and are not defined as governmental meetings or one person in the government would also be too many. Look for fact patterns that contain government officials meeting in an informal setting, such as a birthday party. This is fine so long as no governmental matters are discussed at such an informal meeting. Again, general law enacted by Florida legislator and applied uniformly statewide. Special laws enacted by the Florida legislator and applied to a specific part of the state need either of the following requirements. Notice the population of the state of the part of the state being affected by a special law and approved by a referendum vote of the majority of electors in the part of the state being affected by a special law. General laws of local application enacted by the Florida legislator and applying a specific region to the state, often applying based on by population. Okay, again, here's the difference between enactment of a new law and passing a bill. Enactment of a new law is adequate title, enactment clause, reasonably related to health, safety, moral, and welfare, not vague or overbroad, and single subject. The passing of a bill is read three times, passes both health and identical form, title, only one subject, and governor's signature. So there's a lot that are overlapped there. Um, ad valorem taxes are property taxes. So I've seen an essay where they try to do ad valorem taxes on personal um, things. It's going to be on property. They're levied only by local governance. Look for that. The state cannot levy property taxes. Um, an exception property owned by local governments and used exclusively for a public purpose are exempt from ad taxes. Finally, our homestead exemption, very important. Florida provides protection from creditors for closing or otherwise taking possession or title of an individual's real property when such property is owned by a natural person, serves as a primary residence of the owner or dependent of the owner, for instance, a spouse or minor child, and protects to up to a half acre of contiguous land located inside a municipality or up to 160 acres of contiguous land located outside of a municipality. This includes any improvements to the land, including homes built on the land, et cetera. The primary residence and owner has intent to use his property as principal residence and the owner has a dependent or owner resides at the property. Look for fact patterns talking about how an individual has relocated to Florida for one year for a job, but plans on moving back to Virginia. They would not have the requisite intent there. You can also have proceeds if you sell your house and you intend to use those proceeds, that'll be homestead protected, those proceeds, as long as you do intend to use them to buy a new house. Um, the generally creditors may not seek to satisfy debt against an owner of homestead property in Florida by foreclosing or otherwise taking possession or title of such property. In exception, the following are known as exception creditors and can satisfy debt against an owner of homestead property in Florida by foreclosing or otherwise taking possession of title or such property. That includes tax debts and assessments against the homestead property, mortgagees of the homestead property, and mechanics lien. And then the second way the homestead exemption works is 
you can get um, deductions from your uh, from your tax basis. Twenty five thousand for ad valorem and another twenty five thousand for um, school board. So we could talk about how there's also a tax exemption for the homestead, but mainly as homesteads tested is they're trying to force you to um, foreclose your house, a creditor, but they can't do it. Um, local governments may charge assessment fees for individuals utilizing government facilities. Owner spouse cannot convey a homestead property without the consent of the other spouse. This is to protect the spouse and or dependent of the child. Improper device or conveyance of a homestead property is void. And by death, intestacy will or trust, spouse plus minor plus adult children, you cannot devise because default is surviving spouse has a life estate with vested remainder and the lineal descendants. A spouse plus no minor, again, you cannot devise because surviving spouse has a life estate with vested remainder and the lineal descendants. A no minor, no spouse plus a minor, you cannot devise because all lineal descendants may become tense in common. The only time you may devise is when you have only adult children because it's not their homestead. Um, Okay, that was a good recap of Florida con law. Um, let's take a look uh, at some essays, see what uh, things we can think of. I know con law is a little bit longer than other subjects, but no worries. So this one is actually, um, um, I'm gonna do when I do crim law. This is unreasonable search and seizure, Miranda, search and to interest, and vehicular search. I'm gonna do a whole nother lecture on, on that, those types. Um, how about this one right here? The Florida constitution provides that no one shall be deprived of life, liberty and process without due process of the law. Florida's constitution requirements track those of the federal constitution. Florida does allow recovery when the government places an ordinate burden on property. Alternatively, damages may be awarded when government action places a burden on the property such that a property owner bears a disproportionate burden such as the public at large should be expected to bear more of that burden. Since sex offenders are not members of protected class or related ordinance will be subject to rational basis review, the ordinance will be a help rational basis. Sex offenders can validly be required to register with a sex offender registry. Um, right to liberty is fundamental right. We're talking about strict scrutiny. Um, the Florida constitution prohibits setting excessive bail in fact, everyone jailed for an offense other than a capital or life felony has a right to pretrial release. So long as they do not pose a risk of flight or failing to show up for their court date, they do not pose a risk to judicial process or community at large. We talked about um, ex post facto laws. A, a law cannot um, punish activity that occurred before the ordinance was enacted or before people had a reasonable chance to become aware of the requirements of the ordinance. To be Properly enacted, legislation must contain a short and simple statement of its purpose, contain only one subject matter, contain a description of the law that's easy to understand, and must contain an enacting clause indicated as enacted by the Florida legislator under the authority of the state of Florida. Similar uh, requirements may be applied to the Board of Commissioners and their ordinances. Um, government entanglement, the Florida Constitution provides similar protections as the federal in this regard, so lemon test. Um, double jeopardy. The Florida Constitution prohibits punishment twice for the same offense. Florida specifically permits punishing someone twice under different crimes if the legislator manifests an intent to provide for separate punishments, as long as a crime does not constitute a lesser included offense, does not have all the same elements, and is not merely a different degree and severity of the same offense. Vagueness, an ordinance must specify the harm it protects from or provide requirements that tailor the ordinance towards the objective. If it's overly vague and we're always looking for vagueness, it's unconstitutional because it will punish just as much lawful behavior as it unlawful. Always look for separation of powers. There's a requirement that each body of government has separate powers that may not be infringed by the other body. Commissioners may not establish crimes. Crimes may only be declared by a state legislator. Municipalities may legislate that certain things be considered ordinance violations, but not punished by imprisonment. Florida does not permit someone who's a convicted felon to serve in government office. To be eligible for government office, an individual must not have been convicted of a felony, must be at least 18 years old, must be a resident of Florida, and must not be incompetent. So that was a really good uh, essay to look at. Um, trying to see, 
Okay, we also have some super cool PowerPoints to go over and then we'll go over some essays, model answers. And I think you'll feel pretty good about Florida con law. Oh, and we'll go over the questionnaire too. That'll be the, the best thing. So standing access to courts, we talked about this, injury in fact, causation, redressability, Kluber doctrine, the court shall be open to every person with for redress. Um, Sunshine law, we're gonna sign some light on some shady shit. <laughs> what is the purpose of law? A series of law designed to guarantee that the public has access to the public records of governmental bodies in Florida. Under the Sunshine Laws, all meetings at which public officials discuss public business must be noticed and open to the public. Records of such meetings must also be accessible to the public. The public has a right to government information under the Florida Constitution. There's an exception to the Sunshine Law, meaning requirements for unplanned meetings between state legislators. The exception applies to meetings between two state legislators or one state legislator and the governor. We talked about that. Privacy under the Fourth Amendment. Under the Florida Constitution, the right to privacy is expressly protected. It's stronger than the federal. They have a right to be left alone from their unreasonable government intrusion in their lives. It's a fundamental right. Very broad, it comes up more than just search and seizure. The Florida Constitution also mirrors the Fourth Amendment in the right to search and seizure, which we'll talk about in, in a different essay. Due process, um, discuss both as separate issues. Think of them as BFFs that go to every part together, but you still need to view each one individually. Heading, due process rights of insert hypo. Procedural due process versus substantive due process, minor headings. Procedural due process. Procedural due process requires notice and hearing, easy. If no facts, assume what would be necessary. Substantive due process. Life, liberty, and property, what interest would be affected? When a fundamental right is implicated, strict scrutiny applies. Under strict scrutiny, the government must show that the law is necessary to further a compelling state interest. For all the other rights, only rational basis is required, under which the plaintiffs show that the law is not rationally related to any legitimate government interest. Legitimate government interest under state's general police powers include providing for the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the people. Equal protection, nor shall any state deny to any persons within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Similarly situated people being treated differently. Two-step process. Categorize a group being treated differently, age, disability, gender, race, people who live in certain places, homeless, poor persons. Apply the relevant standard based on the classification of the group, strict scrutiny, intermediate rational basis, and analyze. Be the government's best attorney. Give me their best argument for their interests. After, switch hats and become your client's best attorney. However, nonetheless. Takings clause, eminent domain. Pursuant to its powers of eminent domain, the state and the local governments may take appropriate or physically invade property for justifiable public purpose with just compensation due and owning to the owner of that property. Eminent domain covers the taking of personal property. Um, so this was a swine flu example. Uh, there was this whole ordinance and we looked to see if it was overbroad, if it was vague, if there was just compensation. Um, we look for due, due process and equal protection, hashtag besties for life, what interest is taken, procedural versus substantive, life, liberty, or property, who is being treated differently, what categories of purpose, what standard would apply. Homestead exemption, general and specific, three ways to always hit. Is it homestead? What's protected? What perks does it get because it's homestead? If not homestead, what else can you say about the property after doing the homestead analysis, joint tenancy, tenancy in common, tenancy in by the entirety, let's talk about real property. Is it homestead? To qualify as a homestead, it must be owned by Florida residents, used as a primary residence. It can be no more than 160 acres of contiguous, unincorporated area, or half an acre of an incorporated area. Further, only one residence can qualify as a homestead for any person. What perks do they get? Protection from creditors, favorable tax treatment, and restraints on alienation. All right, pretty solid. Learning is like rolling upstream, not to advance, it's to drop back. Cool. Um, so really, really thorough so far. Um, I'm gonna go over my uh, questionnaire. And to do the questionnaire, I'm gonna choose one of my students from this year's group course, who I think did a very good job. And um, we will see what the correct answers are. And then we'll just go over a few essays and we'll call it a wrap on con law. Difficult subject, but an opportunity to really prevail. We're expecting them to give us an ordinance or an act or some type of state action that's gonna implicate all of these federal and state of Florida considerations. So if I go to my small course, I go to the accountability folder. Let's check in on Joel and see how his questionnaire was on um, con law. 
These questionnaires are great. What are the first 16 amendments? One, freedom of speech, association, assembly, press, religion, establishment. Two, right to bear arms, well regulated militia. Three, you don't have to quarter a shelter a soldier. Four, illegal searches and seizures, fair enough. Five, federal due process, pretrial right to counsel, just compensation and takings. Um, just compensation and takings, let me make sure. Yeah, Fifth Amendment, okay, good job. Good job, Joel, Fifth Amendment. Um, Fifth Amendment's also gonna be pretrial, or I'm sorry, uh, Miranda rights, things like that. Pretrial right to counsel, yeah. Right to counsel after charge, speed trial six, seven is jury over $20. Cruel and unusual punishment is eight, 10 is um, state sovereignty, 11 is sovereign immunity, 13 abolition of slavery and private, you can't have private discrimination based on race. 14 is equal protection, states due process. 16 is federal taxing and spending. Fair enough. Um, race, alienage and national origin for fundamental suspect classes. We remember what strict scrutiny is. Um, campers, re contraception, abortion, marriage, procreation, education, relations, sexual contact, interstate travel, voting, intermediate rational basis, intermediate gender and legitimacy, no disability in Florida, Joel, I appreciate you, but I'm going to make it sure is also going to be uh, strict scrutiny here. We talked about the lemon test. Cool. We talked about content based for content neutral and the differences that need to apply content based strict scrutiny. Um, if it's non public forum, then just needs to be viewpoint neutral. Um, time, place and manner for content neutral on a public forum. Um, True threats, obscenities, incitement, unlawful activities, prior restraints are strongly disfavored. I also want you to add here defamation and um, fraudulent or misleading commercial speech. Uh, what are the requirements for enacting the Orange Law in Florida? Adequate title, enactment clause, single subject, clear and short statement, reasonably related. Passing the bill is read three times. Passed both house in identical form by cameralism, title, single subject, government signature. Excellent, chartered versus unchartered. Chartered under the home rule powers may enact these ordinances we talked about. Vagueness, overbreath, vagueness, we don't understand what's being punished. Overbreath means it's punishing more than what's legal. Sunshine law, we talked about many times, have access to public records, including government records and non-government parties acting under control of the government. Homestead exemption, we always talked about. And uh, right, we talked about half acre inside a municipality, 160 acres outside a municipality, um, must satisfy all the requirements above to be entitled 25 of the home value exempt from taxation, 50K for houses valued over 75,000. So you can get 50,000, usually 25 from ad valorem and 25 from school board. Procedural due process, life, liberty and property, notice and hearing, um, Kluger doctrine, public necessity, if there's a uh, restriction to court. My dog Biscuit's having a crazy dream right now. I can hear him freaking out. Substantive due process is discriminating across the board. I like that. Commerce clause, they can regulate channels, instrumentalities, and economic activity. Dormant commerce clause, um, we uh, can't discriminate against interstate commerce. Possessory versus regulatory takings, we talked about that. And there's always got to be just compensation. The multi factor balancing test, economic impact of the regulation, the extent which has interfered with their investment backed expectations, and the character of the government action. Non-conforming use for variance versus amortization. Non-conforming use, you're grandfathered in. Variance, you're applying to do something different. And amortization, you're uh, stopping over time. Well, wow, Joel did a really good job. He, uh, he's gonna be a good real estate attorney, I think that. Um, speech and debate clause protects members of Congress from being arrested during or while traveling to and from congressional sessions. Clause has been interpreted to protect members of Congress from prosecution for legislative acts. Executive has commander in chief Treaty power, foreign affairs, veto, pocket, um, but not light on veto. Legislative, Congress has plenary powers, power to tax and spend for general welfare, commerce powers. They may not impeach and convict the president. Oh, the president also has pardon powers, federal pardon powers. The governor is going to have state pardon powers. Judicial, Supreme Court and federal courts, hear cases and controversies, courts of limited jurisdiction, Florida cannot pocket veto. What is commandeering? Congress may not commandeer states into enacting or not enacting federal legislation. Congress may, however, condition certain spending based on sufficiently clear guidance and not overly burdensome. Full faith and credit, um, 
Courts in one state must give full faith and credit to judgments of a court in another state if the prior court had jurisdiction over the parties and subject matter and the judgment was on the merits, not found on procedural issues, and the judgment was final. Go bonds versus rev bonds, general obligation bonds that we need a vote that's going to be, you know, to build a school or something that does not collect revenue. Whereas rev bonds, that's going to be bonds that, and these are going to be issued by um, municipalities to collect money to, to build something. A rev bond would be like a toll bridge or um, an airport, something that's going to collect revenue and pay back the bondholders. Not really likely to be tested. So good job, Joel, with the um, cram guide outline. Really appreciate you. And um, the last thing that I'm going to go over today, and I hope that this was thorough because I'm really trying to do a thorough job and making sure if you listen to this lecture, you feel confident, is um, just looking at some of the essays that have been tested and seeing what the model answers, how they're formed. So, um, sorry about that. We see some of the federal ones, um, 2018. Well, this was, this, sorry, this one's about criminal law. Let's go to 2006. Um, let's see what they're talking about here. So you are associated firm that represents plaintiffs. They pass an act, the legislator, the floor Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction to review any decisions of a district court of appeal, affirming a final judgment exceeding $1 million. Any rule or procedure promulgated by the Florida Supreme Court shall be presented to the governor for approval in the same manner as a bill passed by the legislator. Any claim of medical malpractice shall be tried before an administrative hearing officer the hearing officer shall determine fault and award damages in accordance with existing law and the second degree misdemeanor to pass a school bus that displays a stop signal. A lot of things we can think about right here. The act's history shows it was drafted over concerns of excessive jury verdicts and rules of procedure over fairly favorable towards plaintiffs. The act was amended during the floor debate to add section four. So remember that sing single subject. A similar amendment was made on two other bills. So this is all about an act or an ordinance. Like I said, this is very, very common. Um, so several problems. Standing, we always start with standing. If someone wanted to sue for medical malpractice in court, but could not, or someone was appealed, it would be, um, if this act was found invalid, the district court of appeal in the appropriate district, and then in Florida Supreme Court, we have mandatory jurisdiction to hear the appeal, depending on the court the claim originated. The problems in the various clauses are discussed as follows. Clause one attempts to modify the appellate jurisdiction of the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Constitution gives the Florida Supreme Court the discretionary jurisdiction to hear two appeals from the District Court of Appeals for a variety of reasons, including if two DCA opinions conflict, if they are certified to the Florida Supreme Court as of great importance, or if they affirm the validity of a Florida statute or constitutional provision. I'm glad we're doing this essay because it's a little bit different. The Florida Supreme Court has mandatory jurisdiction of appeals arising out of district courts of appeal relating to bond validation proceedings, imposition of the death penalty, and the validation of a statute or constitutional provision. Clause one, providing for the Florida Supreme Court jurisdiction of a DCA case affirming a final judgment exceeding one day dollars based on jury does not fit within that, within that Supreme Court's area of discretionary jurisdiction um, unless, as stated above, it conflicts with another DCA or certified to the Florida Supreme Court as of great public importance. The Florida legislator may not expand or enlarge the discretionary jurisdiction of the Florida Supreme Court as constitutionally mandated. This clause is unconstitutional because it attempts to do so. In contrast, under the federal constitution, Congress has the power to enlarge or reduce the appellate jurisdiction of the US Supreme Court, provide that it does so without excluding appellate jurisdiction of entire subject review. Wow, that was really interesting. And that is true, you know, in federal court, they can, um, and larger reduce appellate jurisdiction in Florida, they cannot. So that's what's wrong with clause one. That is something that is good that I'm doing in my lecture because we don't really see that in other places. Florida two, I mean, clause two, attempts to create a way to modify the creation of rules um, of 
by the Florida Supreme Court. Normally, the legislator passes a bill by a majority of each house and then presents such a bill to the government to either veto or to sign. Under the Florida Constitution, however, the Florida Supreme Court is the exclusive authority to create rules of the Florida courts. The legislator may reject such rules created by the Florida Supreme Court by a two thirds vote, but the legislator may not amend or modify such rules. The Florida legislator has no power to create rules of court procedure as this power is exclusively vested in the Florida Supreme Court according to the Florida Constitution. So I said, we really wanna understand about encroachment and about separation of powers. Um, this is really good to go over. The Florida legislator has no power to create rules of court procedure as this power is exclusively vested in the Florida Supreme Court according to the Florida Constitution. This clause attempts to give the governor the power to veto or accept such rules of the court according to the procedure for enacting other bills in the legislator. This is clearly unconstitutional because it violates separation of powers. The Florida legislature cannot delegate its power to reject the Supreme Court's rules by two thirds vote to the governor. The Florida constitution expressly provides for this procedure. Any attempt by the governor to veto the Florida Supreme Court's rules would violate this constitutional provision. This clause is unconstitutional and cannot be enforced. If so provided, the clause could be severed from the act if the rest of the act is determined to be valid. Okay. Um, access to courts was three, uh, and we probably talk about the Kluger Doctrine right here. Um, the Florida Constitution guarantees its citizens access to courts for all actions at law. It may not deny access to courts without providing a reasonable alternative unless it can justify such action with a compelling government interest and so that such action is nearly tailored to fit, fit that interest. Um, we also talked about a jury trial must be provided in all criminal cases and all civil cases where such a jury trial right to existed at the time the Florida Constitution was adopted. Um, it also seems to run a valve existing statutes which mandate procedure for medical malpractice cases without mention of such an administrative hearing. Clause three attempts to vest judicial authority in administrative hearing officer that offends separation of powers. Um, and it also attempts to vest the first district court of appeal with the power to heal, hear appeals from all cases from the hearing officer for medical malpractice actions. Um, that's unconstitutional as well. This is a really good different essay and we wanna be prepared for anything. So I'm really happy to go over this. Um, this clause is, it's the single subject. The Florida constitution requires that, so look out for single subject, requires that all statutes enacted by the legislator contain only one subject. The single subject rule exists to provide notice and ensure that each title adequately describes what's contained within the statute. The act contains several provisions relating to the courts, but then the last one is criminal law. So this will violate the single subject. Cool, that was a really difficult, difficult essay, but a lot of it was about separation of powers. And what we kind of learned together here was about Florida um, not having the same ability to, uh, to regulate the Court of Appeals. Really good essay to, to learn from. Let's check one more from this folder and then we'll look for the Florida folder. So this is an act. See, it's always an act or an ordinance. And it's about children in school. Um, so we think about education, we think about age, but what's being here? A Florida congressperson introduced a federal legislation. Look out for that. So this is federal legislation. This isn't going to be single subject and, and all those Florida specific things. It's going to be federal. So equal opportunities, we're thinking equal protection. Um, boys and girls, we're thinking of, uh, you know, in, intermediate scrutiny. Um, Speech may be here, groups speaking, and protect a, a memo. So what do we have? Standing, we always start with standing. Do they have standing? Constitutional challenges or state action. Um, public forum, right? When the speech takes place in a public forum, this is gonna be strict scrutiny and all, all those things. Okay. Um, possible tort, they've waived sovereign immunity and tort. Florida suit, I think this is one of the ones we outlined you can see that um, commandeering clause, it's forcing them to act. You can see that it's not ripe yet, ripeness, presidential options. Since this was federal, this is the one that we did outline, whether he can veto the act or not sign into law. Constitutionality, equal protection, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, um, gender, so intermediate scrutiny. 
and then the commandeering clause. That was one of the ones we actually looked at. So let's see, there's a different one. Um, taking back America. This is um, an ordinance. So an unincorporated association of who gathering in Seaside, they're just a group of people who um, Seaside has an ordinance. So it's a town. We, we're going we're gonna to worry about this town that has no parade or, pro or procession already. First Amendment, we think that we're violating. Um, 6 to 11. So I'm already thinking about contracts clause here, maybe. No person shall loiter. Loiter is always going to be vagueness. Um, no unauthorized purpose. So uh, live in the tent. So who are they going after here? What level of scrutiny is going to be applied? Same thing um, with the permit, speech, things of that nature. Um, so they're challenging the ordinance and we're going to challenge it on federal constitutional basis. What do we have? Always standing. Causation, redressability, um, sorry, injury causation, redressability, always standing and its ripeness, sovereign immunity. That's interesting to talk about. Although they're federal, it is suing based on the suicide ordinance. They can sue because they waive sovereign immunity for operational decisions. Oh, I think this is one we, we uh, outlined too. So first amendment, lot you see about speech, narrowly tailored, strict scrutiny, um, suppression of speech. This is a really good one about speech. Um, not all speech is protected, so unprotected speech, vagueness we wanted to talk about. Um, more, this is really about speech. Here we go, due process very well. Um, fundamental rights, substantive procedural due process, equal protection. See, I, would, I this was a good, decent essay. Um, solid. All right, let's look at some from the Florida essay folder. Some of these may be repetitive. Just go over a couple more. City of Beachville, Florida um, is issuing bonds. Okay, this could be about geo bonds and rev bonds, in interesting enough. Um, ad valorem taxes, labor union, so right to work. A new law, so here's a big thing. The governing authority of any municipality with a population, so that's gonna be a law of, um, ge a, a general law of local application, may impose a tax on the rental space. Um, so we're gonna talk about taxes, um, population greater than 3,000, so general law of local application. Let's see what this one gets into. Um, a taking, right? because they're, they're uh, all persons I'm trying to see where we knew it was a taking. Well, it says promote commerce and tourism by constructing convention center. Um, because it's imposing a tax on them. Let's see what they say, is whether they may build a convention center. In order for a city to take an action, it must be one which is traditionally provided by the city. Um, so actually it wasn't really taking this. Um, well, one problem may be that there's a taking, it looks like they're the least the property, an opponent um, will argue that it's using its taxing power, How the, this argument likely fail because they're allowed to build projects such as convention centers because it's general wealth for the city. So it's probably not a taking. I was looking at that, but whatever, they got points for saying it. So then um, whether property will be exempt from ad valorem taxes. Normally all municipal property is exempt from ad valorem taxes. However, when deciding if the municipal property is exempt from ad valorem taxes, you must look to the government purpose versus the commercial purpose test. If the land is being used for a private purpose is not exempt from ad valorem taxes. On the other hand, if it's being used for a government purpose, it would be exempt. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about if it's government purpose to be exempt from ad valorem taxes. That's a really good issue that we haven't really talked about. Um, the right to work is fundamental. We talked about this. Strict scrutiny is going to apply. Um, the financing plan. So general obligation bonds are bonds that are backed by taxes and rev bonds are bonds that are backed by the revenue. So geo bonds require a vote. So I said they don't test as much, but they do test this. Um, it looks like we have a geo bond. It's going to have to pass a referendum. Um, so then it talks about general laws of local application that we talked about here. Um, in order for the legislator to pass a law, it must be passed in legislative session. Laws must have a title that gives notice and not be confusing, contain a single subject, and must contain an enabling clause that says being enacted by the state legislator. General laws are laws that cover everyone in the state, special laws that apply to only certain persons of group, and um, general laws of local application or laws that are general laws that apply uniformly to an area such as one that has a minimum or maximum population. And here they talk about there's no enacting cause and that it's probably a valid general law with a minimum application. Um, the legislators pass an invalid law because it's special and only applies to certain cities that have a location of over 300,000. So again, that, that's the argument there. But this was a good, you got points for knowing a lot of things. They did talk about general geo bond versus rev bond. So make sure we know geo bond, you have to pay taxes on. Rev bond is supported by um, the revenue of the actual project. will be subject to feasibility studies. Um, we talked about when a law can be passed and what are the necessities for a law and then fundamental right of right to work. And um, knowing that the municipality, not the state, the municipality can collect ad valorem taxes, but it cannot collect ad valorem taxes from public entities. So that was a pretty good one to just show different things. Con law is very tough. I think con law and real property, probably the toughest Florida essay subjects because they go the most, they can go the most directions. All right, let's see. This is for juveniles. So we already see probably rational basis because they're young people. Um, it's gonna be an ordinance right here. So we have an ordinance, um, juveniles, 11 to six. I'm also already thinking about contracts, impairment of contracts. Um, they're gonna do stuff. So maybe freedom of speech, um, all sorts of things here. Let's see what we got. Oh, great, finally, Sunshine Law. We definitely wanna make sure, I, I told you, Sunshine Law will come up. Be very prepared to write about Sunshine Law. The first action as that issue is the discussion that led to the creation of the ordinance at the House. Florida Sunshine Law argues that all meetings of public officers in the state where the officers are discussing business must be open to the public. The records must be public record and notice must be provided so that they have an opportunity to attend the, the meeting. There are exceptions where there are fewer than three legislators or not two legislators and the governor. Um, other than those exceptions, boom, boom, boom. So great, talking about Sunshine Law. Then they talk about juveniles, fundamental rights of privacy. The Florida has a fundamental right to privacy in the Fourth Amendment, I like that. Um, if this was getting into a search and seizure, so we'll talk about some criminal law things in my criminal law lecture. Legality of the ordinance, if it's overbroad, we always argue that's overbroad or vague. I like that. Oh, this talks about municipalities and chartered counties can create laws, while uncharted counties would not be able to do so, so that's good. Equal protection, a key. Right, equal protection, and it's gonna be rational basis because they're minors. First Amendment, freedom of speech. I like that. Impairment of contracts, we were looking because it could um, impede their contract. And then standing, they should have talked about this from the beginning. We always say if they had standing to bring suit. Love that one. That one seems pretty common. Let's see what's going on in uh, 2005. And how we've done this. Oh, this one's about Florida con law, um, Stockbroker Relief Act. So what, what is being legislated here? It's a Florida legislator, the act. So here we are gonna look for acts. How are we gonna um, attack this ordinance? Well, stockbrokers, um, so probably rational basis. I see um, must non-binding mediation. So it's gonna be talking about your rights to a jury trial here try without a jury that's you know going to be their rights um lowest priority so they're discriminating um an advancement fee access to courts counties with a population general law of local application Let's see what things they talk about here 
um, standing, always start with standing, single subject rules. So they talk about all the, to, must be constitutional, clearly written, not overbroad, lawful purpose. Here, access to courts and right to con contract. Kluger doctrine, right, to overcome access to courts. Um, unlawful bill of attainder, infringing on separation of powers and right to jury trial. I like that. Access to courts again, we're gonna talk about all these things. Um, discrimination, rational basis, then two types of laws, general and special, they, they talk about that a lot. And then general arguments, privilege and immunities, equal protection, commerce clause and due process. And they go into each one of them. Just like in torts, I'm gonna teach you to throw the kitchen sink. We're gonna do that in con law. We're gonna throw the kitchen sink of all the constitutional um, arguments that we may have. So we'll look at one more. The state of Florida passed a statute that says no media. So we're thinking of first amendments, you know, those different things, a newspaper here. So we're probably talking about defamation because it includes torts. Um, let's see what it gets into. Standing, if we haven't established this, you always wanna talk about standing. Then first amendment, freedom of the speech, excellent. Um, equal protection, we talk about that a lot. Who's a protected class? And then defamation, this is gonna be a, a, towards an invasion of privacy, which could be a common law claim. And you know what, just for good measure, let's look at one more, um, see what happened in February, 2021. So there's some Florida con law issues here. Let's see what they end up being, because it's mostly trust, but I, get, I bet the con law issue was homestead exemption. I bet it was, yep. In Florida, homestead exemption applies to prevent creditors from attaching to the interest of an owner of a homestead property. The scope of homestead protection is half an acre inside a municipality, 106 years outside a municipality. Exceptions include mortgages, mechanic liens, and property taxes. So that was what they're talking about. So I definitely established clearly that homestead exemption and sunshine law come up a lot. Um, I'm gonna stop the sharing because I know we went over a lot of things. It could be overwhelming. And just kind of recap what we went over. Federal lens, look at it from the constitutional perspective. Think about all the amendments. Think, you know, especially due process and equal protection and your, your general freedoms um, and your right to privacy. Now, some other things that we, we saw were separation of powers and encroachment and commandeering clause. Those things do come up and what the president's powers are. And then from a Florida lens saying, is it, has a law or bill been properly enacted and properly passed? and homestead exemption, sunshine law. And then we saw today about general laws, special laws, um, general laws of local application, home rule powers, um, chartered versus unchartered counties. And then some real specific thoughts about what the Florida um, legislator can and cannot do. They don't have the power to amend the judicial process. And you know, some thoughts about the mayor and what the mayor can do. And when there's a special session, it can only be for what's called in that session. And um, the Florida mayor does not have a pocket veto like the, the president of the United States. So all sorts of issues, the constitution is grand, but just remember our objective when we get one of these con law essays is to attack the ordinance or federal legislation or local um, policy that that is has state action and start with standing and then go all the way through and attack it on every single way possible and be consistent go through sometimes you might have to make the same argument twice but you don't need to write the same rule twice try to do IRAC statements if possible issue rule analysis conclusion and even IRAOC issue rule analysis opposing argument and then conclusion um, this was very thorough this Probably this, I guess this in real property, I assume, will be one of the longest lectures, but I hope you really feel that I didn't leave any stone unturned and you feel pretty confident that you can attack a con law essay on the Florida bar exam. So thank you so much for joining me today. You see on my shirt, state of coconut growth, that's my neighborhood. And I'm here from Guinea Springs, which if you ever do have the um, opportunity to visit, it's super beautiful, super peaceful. So thank you all so much. Have a great day and best of luck on your exam.